Great. Well, thanks, Jordan, for the prayer and for the team, just for leading our hearts in worship and singing this morning. We'll invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Acts chapter 17. We're going to have a, a quick trip in Acts chapter 17 this morning and look at some of the events that happened in the life of the Apostle Paul when he was in Athens. It is my intention in a week or two to be able to open up the book of Philippians. I want to teach through that. Maybe that'll take us for a number of weeks, maybe take us close to the end of the year. But for this morning, we're going to look at Acts chapter 17. And really the reason why I'm jumping right into into the middle of the book of Acts here in chapter 17 is that uh, Fred Barton and I are heading off to a uh, preacher's conference this week for two or three days. It's at Hastings uh, Baptist Church, and this is my assigned passage. So I thought I would kind of kill two birds with one stone here by doing it this morning, but also preparing for that conference. It is really an incredible section of Scripture that I'm sure will be an encouragement and a help for you this morning. But as we open up Acts chapter 17, the, the main character in the story here is the Apostle Paul, and he's been having a bit of a rough time lately in his life. He's a, a passionate evangelist, and he's been preaching the gospel virtually to anyone or anything that would listen to him, and he's been zipping around all over the countryside proclaiming the good news. But as he's been preaching, he's also been attracting a fair amount of opposition, There are a a bunch of antagonists who really don't like his preaching, and everywhere Paul goes, they've been trying to run him out of town. He started off in Antioch, and he was there with his friend Silas, and then a little bit later on in his trip, this is the second missionary journey, if you're familiar with his journeys, a little later on, he um, calls a young man called Timothy, probably a teenager at the time, to come and join them. But anyway, as he travels Paul is with Silas, and he ends up in a place called Philippi. And if you remember, when he was in Philippi, he was beaten up, and he was thrown into prison. And in the middle of the night, there was a massive earthquake, and the prison broke open. And uh, uh, remember the Philippian jailer who was saved, who asked the question, what must I do to be saved? And remember that story in the book of Acts. Well, Paul got released from prison, And he basically limped his way to Thessalonica. He was all battered and bruised from the beatings he had received uh, back in Philippi. He arrives in Thessalonica, and he's preaching the gospel there. And a lot of people become Christians. They follow Christ. In fact, if you read through the text, it says that when he was in this place called Thessalonica, some people would say of him that Paul was turning the world upside down. But Paul and Silas get run out of town, out of Thessalonica, by a mob of gangsters. They end up going to Berea, another little town, and that same mob of wicked men, they find out that Paul has moved cities, and so they go looking for him in Berea. And so by this time, as Paul's been going from city to city or town to town, Paul's mates basically say to him, you know, enough is enough, Paul. And they help him to escape Berea. They put him on a boat And he travels about the equivalent distance from Napier up to Auckland on a boat, and he ends up in this place called Athens. And Timothy and Silas, his co-workers, they promise to meet him there sometime soon, which is where we pick up the story today. In Acts chapter 17, if you've got your Bibles there, follow along. I want to read this whole section to us. We're going to begin in verse 16. Acts 17, verse 16 says this, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, that's Timothy and Silas, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. 
For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this... He has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. But others said, we will hear you again about this. And so Paul went out from their midst. But some men joined him and believed. Among among them also were Dionysius and the Arabicite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Well, it's an interesting passage, and uh, I want to just kind of help us uh, put our arms around this passage today and just unfold it. We're going to look at basically five themes, I guess you could say, from this uh, particular passage. We're going to look at the the city, the preacher, the audience, the message, and the response. The first thing I want us to notice, though, is, is the city of Athens. It was an idolatrous city. Just let us sort of set the scene for this passage to begin with. Paul, as I said, he arrives here in Athens. He's all by himself. He's waiting for his friends Silas and Timothy to come and join with him. I mean, if we think of modern-day Paris or perhaps New York, that's what Athens was like back in the first century. It was a very um, cultural city. It was a philosophical city. Athens was once the greatest city in all the world, they said, but by the time Paul gets here to Athens, it really played second fiddle to the city of Corinth. But Athens was still a significant city. It was uh, it housed the the world's most famous university. It was really the, the city of knowledge, you could say. It was the intellectual capital of the world. Some of the deepest thinkers of the day, some of the philosophers would gather in Athens to talk and to discuss and to debate all kinds of things. It was the, the birthplace and the home of some of the Greek philosophers. You'd be familiar with Socrates and Plato and Aristotle. These men were, were from Athens. And even in the passage this morning, Luke, who is the, the author of Acts, he identifies a couple of other philosophical parties there in verse 18. He talks about the, the Epicureans. They were the followers of a man called Epicurus, and these people believed that the purpose of life was just pleasure and happiness, and their goal in life was to live a pain-free life. They were what you might say materialists. They said that everything just came from atoms and that there was no life after death. Everything just returned to matter, and the Epicureans also believed in God's But these gods didn't become involved personally with human events. That's who these Epicureans were. And then Paul also, or um, Luke, sorry, talks about the Stoic philosophers in verse 18 there. These Stoics were followers of a man called Zeno, and they were really pantheists. They, They kind of were the type of people that wanted to live harmoniously with nature. If you wanted to know, call them the Green Party, that's kind of what they were like. They were rationalists, and uh, that's what they thought was the answer to life's problems, rationalism. I mean, when you think about it back in that culture, but even think about our culture today, I mean, we could add a bunch of 
philosophies to that list. There's the Epicureans, the Stoics, but then in today's um, culture, we could say we have people like that as well, the pragmatists or the humanists or the agnostics or the atheists or the communists or the Marxists. All of these are just philosophical groups, people who claim to have wisdom. In fact, we could name any philosophy that denies the existence of the one true and living God. That's what, was, what it was like in Athens. There were all of these philosophers. It was a city packed full of men who thought that they were wise. And these philosophers had invented multiple theories on the purpose of life. And in the process of coming up with their theories, they had also made these idols and these false gods. That's a little bit about the the city of Athens. We could say so much more about it, but just to give you a little bit of a taste of what the city was like. But I want to move to the second theme, and that is really the talking about Paul, who was a, a passionate evangelist. I mean, if you, if you ever get stuck in an unfamiliar city all by yourself, I mean, what would you do? If the city was a safe city, I'm sure you would do what Paul did. He wandered around and he looked at the city. He was looking at the sites, looking at the attractions, but it really didn't matter what direction that Paul was looking at when he wandered through the city of Athens because everywhere he looked, he was confronted with idols. You could say that Athens was the capital city of idolatry. In fact, some people would even say that there were more idols in Athens than there were people. So as he looked around, he saw these religious statues. He saw these temples everywhere. He certainly didn't spot an evangelical church. He didn't see Athens Bible Church anywhere, certainly not yet. Some would even say that Athens was like a, an architect's dream with all, of the, with all of those affluent temples and with all of those extravagant buildings. And even today, the number of those buildings are still standing. Some of you may have even been there or you may have seen the Acropolis, which is a big building up on the hill there in Athens. But to Paul, as he looked around the city, he didn't see any architectural beauty. He saw endless evidence of paganism and false religion and idolatry. And his heart was grieved. Look at verse 16 in the text there. It says that Paul's spirit was provoked within him as he saw all of these idols. In other words, as Paul's looking around the city, he's getting frustrated on the inside. He's getting, he's getting angry. In fact, he's, he's just getting infuriated as he looks around the city and he sees all those buildings and monuments and temples that were all dedicated to false gods. Really, the only thing that Paul saw in Athens was idol after idol after idol. And by the way, an idol is anything that hinders you from worshipping the true and living God. That's what an idol is. It's anything in your life that becomes, a, it becomes like a preoccupation or a, an obsession or instills in you a passion greater than what you have for God. That is an idol. And in Athens, these idols were primarily objects that you could see. I mean, I remember... When I visited Myanmar, it was um, Rangoon, which is the largest city in in Myanmar, walking around it. It was like there was a Buddhist temple on every corner of that city. And then as you walk up and down the streets, you would see mosques, Muslim mosques up and down the streets. Just like Athens, that was a city full of idols and full of idol worshippers. But I want to ask you this question this morning. Is Napier or Hastings any different? Is it any different? There are idol worshippers all around us. It may not be that they're bowing down to Buddha or to some wooden idol or to some statue, but we have idols today in our culture. The idols today that we have often have screens and they connect to the internet. We have idols such as materialism, which is um, accumulation of more stuff and more things. We have the idol of success, which is we want a better education or a better job or a newer car or a bigger business. We have the idol of self-worship, where we just worship ourselves. We have multiple modern-day idols, even in our 
country and in our region. And as Paul looked around Athens, he saw these massive spiritual needs. But the question that I want to even put to us today is, what do you see when you look around Hawke's Bay? What do you see? Do you look at Hawke's Bay and marvel at the ocean and enjoy, talk about the nice climate? Do you boast about the fertile soil that we have and all the multi-million dollar agriculture and viticultural industries that we have? When you think of Hawke's Bay, do you just think of like Art Deco and Magpies Rugby? I mean, what, what would the Apostle Paul see and what would the Apostle Paul say if he came to Hawke's Bay? I think he would say that Hawke's Bay is a region of 100,000 people who are lost in 21st century idolatry who desperately need Jesus Christ. I think that's what Paul would say. Paul looked around Athens and he was upset because he saw residents, many of the residents who were breaking the first two of the Ten Commandments, which say, you shall have no other gods before me, God says. You shall, make for your, you, you shall not make for yourselves an idol. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. And so as a, <clears throat> as a passionate evangelist, the Apostle Paul couldn't remain quiet here. And it's kind of like when you ruffle the feathers of an evangelist or a passionate evangelist, he goes to work, and that's exactly what Paul does here. He doesn't wait for Paul and Silas to show up. Paul starts preaching right away, he starts preaching the gospel. It says there in verse 17, he goes into the synagogue. The synagogue is where the Jewish people would meet together on the Sabbath, which is on a Saturday, and these Jewish people were very, very religious, but they were very, very lost. They believed in God, but they didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And so Paul would go to the synagogues to preach the message of Jesus to them. And if you actually look back in, in chapter 17, go right back to the beginning of chapter 17, you'll see that when Paul was in Thessalonica, he went into the synagogue. In verse 2, it says that he went in, as was his custom, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them, with the Jews from the Scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ, that is the Messiah, to suffer and to rise from the dead. And Paul would say to them, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ, he is the Messiah. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few leading woman. So Paul gets preaching. He goes first to the synagogues and preaches to the Jews there. But then if you look at the verse 17, he not only goes there, he goes into town and he does a little bit of street preaching in the marketplace. And as he goes around the streets, he's bumping into all of these philosophers who are in town and these philosophical parties, the Epicureans and the Stoics, as I've talked about, and many others, no doubt, and he's preaching to them. And he's preaching the gospel to them. And they didn't really like it. They actually called Paul in verse 18 a babbler, which is not a compliment. It's kind of like he's saying, they're saying to Paul that he's just an uneducated guy. He's an ignorant guy. He's got a, a bit of a small brain. Literally, it was a, it was, he was a seed picker. That's what a babbler means. And so they were referring to Paul as one who just picked up a, a few little ideas. And the implication is that he was just ignorant. He didn't really know what he was talking about. He lacked real understanding. But because these philosophers loved a good debate and they loved a good discussion, they didn't want to shut down Paul completely, and so they were willing to, to discuss things and converse with him. In fact, someone there decided that Paul should go and have a conversation with all of the philosophical heavies of the day. These were the, the big boys who would meet at a place called the Areopagus. In verse 19, we see that, and this is the third See, the third theme I want us to see in this passage, that is the, the curious audience, which is the Areopagus. I mean, Paul's just been to the synagogue. He's been wandering through the town, through the marketplace. He's had some informal interactions with all these people. But now Paul gets invited to go to this place called the Areopagus. Uh, sometimes this place is called Mars Hill. Maybe if you've got a King James Version, that's what it'll say in your translation. Going to the Areopagus was kind of like going to a, like a courthouse, to a, to a courtroom. And there were about 30 men who 
presided over this Areopagus. It's, it's kind of like you could think of them as like 30 courtroom judges who would meet together and they would deal with all the judicial and all the, the legislative matters. But they also would deal with religious matters. And so Paul has the opportunity to come and stand before these men at the Areopagus. And he was able to explain in detail his teaching, this new teaching to them, which was about this man called Jesus and the resurrection. And so these men were eager to hear this new teaching, so Paul's given an opportunity here to speak to them. The fourth thing I want you to see in this passage, and that is the message. It was a life-changing proclamation. So when you think about this whole passage, take a bit of a step back here for a second. We find ourselves in this city full of idols. We have a passionate, faithful, fearless preacher or evangelist called Paul. We have a curious audience now, the Areopagus. But there's one thing missing in this picture, and that's what we're about to see now. And that is a great message, and it's about to come. This section of Scripture is a great treatise on how to do evangelism. You could say that Paul like waxes eloquently here in these next 10 verses, and he begins by saying to these men, I notice that you are very religious. That wasn't offensive for them to hear that. Paul wanted these men to just have open ears and open hearts to listen to his message. And so he says to them, I've seen your city. I've seen your religious symbolism everywhere. I even found something that caught my attention. It was an altar, and it had this inscription written on it. And so Paul makes this connection with them. He, he establishes this point of contact with them. He says, I found this altar which said on it to the unknown God. I mean, Paul had seen nearly every false god under the sun there, including this one called the unknown God. And so Paul takes that and he uses it as a point of connection with his audience in order to start this gospel conversation with them. It really did give him a good launching pad. And so really, Paul just takes something which is an everyday illustration to start a gospel conversation, which is a great lesson, I think, for us, even at the outset, that we can use everyday things or everyday current events to start gospel conversations. You should do it like Paul has done it here. It might be something that's happened in the news or in politics or in, uh, in our culture, or whatever it might be. It could be around the issues that are a bit more controversial, like the euthanasia and the, and the abortion issues and the anti-spanking, the spanking, all those kind of things, global warming, whatever. Take an issue that is relevant to the day that unbelievers are willing to talk about and see if you can direct it to a gospel conversation. That's what Paul does here. And he says to these men at the Areopagus here, he says, what, what you worship in ignorance, I proclaim to you. I mean, these Athenians, these people from Athens, they didn't want to be accused of being ignorant. And so they're willing to listen to what Paul had to say. Remember that the, the people who lived in Athens, they, they were polytheists. They believed in many gods. And not only that, they were pantheistic, some of them, which means they believed that God was in things, in everything. But Paul begins his gospel by teaching about the one and only true and living God. He's going to preach what we might say monotheism, which is just one God. I mean, this is, a, this is a profound passage that Paul is about to explain to us. And I want you to notice too, before we get into these verses, that Paul takes a different approach here with these Greek philosophers than what he does with the Jews in the synagogue. Remember the Jews in the synagogue, they already know that there's one God. They had the Old Testament scriptures to, to teach them that. Their problem was that they had a misunderstanding about who Jesus truly was. However, these Greek philosophers, these non-Jews, they had no biblical foundation. They didn't have the Old Testament. So Paul has to go all the way back to Genesis 1.1 to begin his gospel message. I mean, if you're, if you're sharing the gospel or if you're wanting to share the gospel with someone who, who has no 
biblical foundation whatsoever, you need to go back to Genesis 1-1 and begin with creation. So let's have a look at this. As, uh, we'll just unpack these in a hurry here because Paul really teaches us so much truth about the character of God. Line by line, thought by thought, we're going to go through this. This is like, you could say, theology 101 and 10 verses. Paul says this to them. This I proclaim to you, verse 24, God is creator. There's a number of things I'm going to point out to you that you're going to see here about God. God is creator, the God who made the world and everything in it. This is where you start when you share the gospel with somebody who knows nothing about Christianity. The real God made everything. He created the universe and the sun and the moon and the stars and the trees and the animals. Psalm 19 verse 1 says, The heavens are declaring the glory of God. All creation points to a creator. This is the foundational truth of the gospel. And then Paul says also, He is that God is the king of the universe, being Lord of heaven and earth. As creator, God is the Lord of heaven and of earth. He is the ruler of the world. You could say he's the boss. He's the one who is in charge. He, is, he is, has the ultimate authority. And then Paul says at the end of verse 24, he does not live in temples made by man. In other words, God lives, he's omnipresent. He really kind of lives in heaven, but he's omnipresent. You cannot put God in a box. He is not limited by space. If you go to um, Revelation 4, uh, chapter 4 and chapter 5, it talks too about God's place as heaven. It's a, a massive place, a, an incredible place. And God being spirit is everywhere. He's omnipresent. You can't pin him down to one location. Think about in Athens, all of these idols that you had in Athens, all of these little, little gods there, they lived in temples. They were housed in little buildings. And Paul says, my God's not like that. You can't put my God in a box. He's everywhere. And then Paul says that God is self-sufficient. says there, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. God doesn't need help. He doesn't need anyone to help him. He doesn't need us to, to dry him off and shine him up after it rains, as it did, as they did in Athens when it rained and they needed to make their idols look clean and shiny again. God has everything he needs. He doesn't need our help. We also see in verse 25 that God is the life giver since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. See, on the other hand, we are, we are desperately in need of God's help. And he helps us. God is the life giver. God is our creator. He created you. He gives you your every breath. I've said this a number of times. The only reason why you are alive right now is because God gives you the ability to fill your lungs with air and exhale it. In fact, everything that you have is a gift from God. He is the life giver. Verse 26, God created humanity. Not only did he create the universe, but he created humanity. He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on the face of the earth. And we know it all began in the Garden of Eden when God created Adam. And from Adam came the human race. We are not the result of some primeval soup or some big bang theory nor are we a collection of matter and energy that just so happened to accidentally link together. God created us and put us on this planet for a purpose, to worship him and to glorify him. Verse 26 tells us too that God is sovereignly in control of all the nations. It says there, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling. In other words, God is sovereignly in control of all the nations of the earth. Nations have come and nations have gone. In other words, New Zealand will only exist for as long as God decrees it to exist. He's in charge of that. He's completely in control of every nation and exactly where those nations' boundaries are. That would have been a real blow to the people in Athens to hear that because they thought that they were the one true nation. But they weren't. Verse 27 tells us that God is relational. That says there that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. 
I mean, with all of these truths about God and what he's done for humanity, common sense would indicate that man should pursue a relationship with God. God is a personal God, and he, re- he welcomes a personal relationship with humanity. With all the evidence for the existence of God all around us, man ought to pursue a relationship with God. God is relational. God is imminent. Look at verse 27 there in the middle of it. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. You know, on the one hand, God is, we say, transcendent. That means that he is far above us. He's majestic. He's holy. He's righteous. He's all-powerful. But he is also, at the same time, imminent, which means that he's close that he's not far from us, that he's willing and that he's ready and he's waiting for men and women to acknowledge him and to reach out to him and follow him. The next thing we see there is that God is the reason for life, you could say. He's the answer to life. For, listen, for, listen to this, for in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Did you see that? True life is in him. It's in God. We can only define and understand life when we see it through God's eyes, if you want to say it that way. We are fully dependent on him. You owe your existence to God. In him and him alone can we find the real answers to life. And so Paul's even saying to these Athenians, he's saying, don't follow those idols. Don't look for satisfaction in other relationships or in other religious objects or in other religious worship. The true meaning of life is found in God and God alone. And we are all created by God and we are made in his image. And so life can only truly be explained when we explain it through who God is and what he has done for us. Verse 29 says that God is not dead. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. God is not just some mass of material like gold or silver or stone, it says. God is not a picture. He's not an idol. He wasn't formed by man. He's not lifeless. It's, he's, he's not the figment of someone's imagination, Paul is saying here. You can't just make an image and then call it the one true God. God is not dead. He is not some lifeless object. God is alive and well. And then notice what he says in verse 30, that God is patient. God is patient. The time or the times of ignorance God overlooked. He has overlooked the ignorance of all of the worship, all the world's idol worshippers. God is long suffering, you could say. He doesn't deal with people's sin straight away. He's patient. He waits and he's overlooked the, the ignorance of these people for a long time. And then notice in verse 30 as well that God is gracious. God is gracious. This is kind of like the heartbeat really of this whole passage. But now God commands all people everywhere to repent. Knowing that there is only one true God is helpful. It's helpful to know all these truths about God, but it's not enough to save you. God is gracious. He offers idolaters and sinners and pagans and the ignorant the opportunity to put all that behind them, to put all the errors and their selfishness and their sin behind them. How does he offer that? He offers it by commanding everyone everywhere to repent. I mean, that statement was true for every unbeliever, every pagan that was living in Athens, but it's true for every unbeliever living in New Zealand as well. God is gracious and he gives us the opportunity to repent. Even if we've messed up our lives to this point in our life, God gives us the opportunity to put things right. And the way that he offers us that opportunity is that we would repent, which means that we turn from our idols and we turn to follow the true and the living God. That's what it means to repent. 
And you might ask the question, well, why do I need to repent? Well, the next verse tells us that. Verse 31 tells us that God is the final judge. It says there, because God has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. We need to remind ourselves that judgment day is coming. And we are all going to stand before God, and we're going to have to give an account for how we have lived this life. And so God is not only our creator at the beginning, but he is our judge at the very end. And he is going to judge the living and the dead. He is going to um, judge everybody. And those who have rejected God in this life, God is going to judge them and they will have eternal punishment. And for those who have followed him in this life and brought glory to him, he will give the reward of eternal life. And you might ask the question, well, how do we obtain that? eternal life. Well, the next part of the verse says this. It says that God has raised Jesus from the dead. It proves his power, that he is all powerful. He says this, and of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him, that's Jesus, from the dead. And verse 31 tells us that God will judge in righteousness. That is his standard. You must be righteous. You must be sinless when God judges you if you want to get into heaven. If you, listen to this, if you stand before God at the end of time and you are not righteous, you will not go to heaven. Did you get that? If you stand before God on judgment day at the end of time and you are not righteous, you will not go to heaven. That might be the most important statement I make today. God judges in righteousness. There is only one way that you can stand before God as righteous, and that is if you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. I'll tell you about, a bit more about that in a moment. So that's the message that Paul preaches to these people. And a fantastic message about the character and the attributes of God. And then just fifthly and quickly, just want to point out here that there was a mixed response to Paul's message. Some people listened to that message and they just mocked him. <laughs> we don't want to listen to that. We didn't like that. That's foolish. And they rejected the message. Some people listened to it and they said, hey, that's okay. We want to listen to you some more. Uh, They're just kind of delaying that a little bit. But Paul didn't stick around. He wasn't going to give them another message. And so they were going to miss out. But then it says that some people heard the message. They believed it. They repented. And they chose to follow Jesus Christ. In fact, one of the men in in that group of men in the Areopagus believed the message. And he became a follower of Christ. I guess the question for us is this morning is, what are you going to do with this message? Psalm 14 verse 1 says, The fool has said in his heart that there is no God. Paul has just told us that there is a God. And the question is, do you know him? Do you know this God? If you want to know and follow the one true God, you need to know who he is. And we've just seen a a long list of his qualities and his attributes. But to know God, you must also know who Jesus Christ is and why he came. Paul preached in his messages and in his gospel that Jesus Christ had died and that he rose from the dead. And you might even ask the question, well, who is Jesus? I haven't talked about a lot, of, a lot about him this morning. Well, Jesus had a miraculous birth. He lived a perfect life for 30 years. He lived on earth. He lived a perfect life, but then he suffered a horrific death on a Roman cross. And when he died on that cross, the Bible tells us that Jesus took the punishment for all of the sin that you have committed and that I have committed, past, present, and future. And if we are willing to believe that he did it for us, and if we're willing to put our faith and our trust in Jesus Christ, 
and believe in his resurrection, the Bible says that we will be saved. That's what we call repenting, turning from our sin, turning from our idols, whatever our idols are, and turning to follow the true and the living God. And the Bible tells us this, when somebody becomes a Christian, when you turn your back on your sin and your idols and your idolatry and your selfish living, and you choose to follow Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us that God will treat us as if we are righteous And when we stand before God on judgment day and we have to give an account of our lives, we can't say anything more than all I have is the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And God will let us into heaven if you follow Jesus Christ because of that truth. You will be welcomed into heaven. And that's the message that Paul was preaching to the people in Athens. It's the message I'm preaching to you today. It's exactly the same message. Jesus Christ died, he rose again, he's alive today, he's exalted at his Father's hand in heaven, and if we choose to follow him and surrender our life to him and trust him, we will go to be with him one day forever and forever. That's the good news that Paul preached, it's the good news that we preach, and I trust that it is the good news that you have embraced in your life. Will you bow your heads with me as we we pray? Father, we thank you again just for the, the wonderful truths of Scripture. Thank you for the, uh, the life of the Apostle Paul and the great testimony and the great example that he is to us. And Lord, thank you for the message that he preached. It's the same one that we preach today. And Lord, our, our desire is that we would truly follow you as you would want us to. Lord, I pray that even if there be someone here today that hasn't followed you, I pray that they would hear this message and that it would, that it would burn in their hearts and in their minds and that they would truly turn to Christ who is the righteous one and from whom we alone can only get the righteousness of Christ. Lord, we know we cannot trust in our good works. We cannot trust in our own efforts. We cannot trust in the efforts of anybody else but in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that we would run to him and find life, true life, eternal life, because of who he is and because of what he's done for us. Help us do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.